Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar hosted by Hello Tomorrow and Science Co, where we will be discussing how we can leverage AI to accelerate growth in the chemical and materials industry. We'll be looking into recent developments in the space, exploring some key enablers and challenges in the current AI boom, and how companies like Microsoft and Science Co can work with startups to develop and scale new technology. As a reminder, the panel discussion will last for around 45 minutes with a Q&A session afterwards. We would love to hear your questions to the panelists. So you can leave these in the dedicated Q&A box just down below. Feel free to upvote the ones that you would love answered live on air. Now, before we start the conversation, we would love to give a very brief introduction to Hello Tomorrow and also the Science Co partnership. So Hello Tomorrow, who are we? We are a global organization that aims to bring high impact innovations from lab to market, what we refer to as deep tech or emerging technologies. Our ultimate goal is to connect our global ecosystem to solve some of our world's most pressing challenges. Now we do this via four main pillars. The first one is to scout these innovative solutions. So notably through our global challenge for our early stage deep tech startup competition. Secondly, we work with corporations to provide tailor-made services on open innovation across industries and technologies. And thirdly, by sharing, uh, analyzing and also sharing our insights on the deep tech ecosystem, the current trends through our articles, webinars and reports. You can find these on the Deep Tech Observatory online. Lastly, and most importantly, it's building a collaborative ecosystem to enable this change. One of our flagship events is our annual global summit, which takes place next month between the 21st and the 22nd of March in Paris. So we bring together all the key change makers, so founders, investors, uh, researchers, corporates, etc. Of note, we have a long standing partnership with Science Co, who are united to bring about tangible, transformative change for a better world. They are supporting our industrial biotech and new materials track for the global challenge and they will also be coming to our global summit next month so if you have the chance uh, please join us and also be part of the change today we are joined by a fantastic panel full of leaders in the global chemical manufacturing space as well as digital transformation so without further ado, Vincent, Yuri, Alan, and Nicolas, please introduce yourselves and your company. Thank you, Rainbow, and thank you very much for the for the opportunity of the of this panel. So I think it's important on my side uh, that I introduce as well Science Co. As we are a new company, we have just been born on December 8th, but we build on the very long and strong heritage from, from Solve. And uh, on the spirit of in innovation from our founder Ernest Solvay back uh, uh, some years ago, um, I think it's important as well that um, we, we love this opportunity to to join this webinar because innovation is at the core of who we are. We are investing quite a lot on our research and development organization everywhere. We are fostering um, our innovation agenda through growth platforms. So we cover uh, battery materials. We cover thermospat thermoplastic composite, we cover um, bio, biomaternals and biotechnology and as well uh, and more that we want to accelerate on, on that side. And uh, at the same time, uh, we have a strong agenda through our uh, uh, through our Science Co Ventures uh, fund that is partnering with you, Hello Tomorrow, and as well supporting and investing and collaborating with startups. So that's really at the core of our DNA, DNA and who we are. But at the same time, just wanted to say that we are in the in the mission as well, in a, in wish to accelerate our AI agenda. And as our CEO Idam Kadri uh, said it very well, we the what has been clarified. We're a science com company, but the how this is where we want to accelerate. And we have two ways to look at the how. One is on we need to dare, uh, so we need to uh, use AI to accelerate the way we, we deliver sustainable solutions to our customers. We need to accelerate uh, the way we co-create with our customers and uh, foster the dialogue through open innovation with uh, uh, startups and universities. And uh, because at the end, our ultimate goal is really to advance humanity. But at the same time, we need to, to care 
And that's the reason why uh, we want as well to ensure that we put people at the center of that transformation. And I'm sure we will dialogue about that today. And um, at the same time, we, we know that we, we need to have through artificial intelligence, we know that it raises concrete questions on the how uh, to ensure that we do the right thing at the end of the day. So I'm really thrilled uh, to be in this uh, webinar and uh, with my estimated uh, panelists around the call. Uh, I think we all share the same mindset. We want to go with speed. Uh, we want to be focused and we want to deliver value for, for everyone that we work with. So looking forward to that dialogue. Uh, thank you, Vincent. So I'll go next. Uh, so good morning, afternoon, or maybe evening, depending on where you are seeing this webinar. I am Yuri Gomez. I am the global lead for process industries uh, at Microsoft. And that means I am developing and accelerating all the go-to-market strategies to support all the chemical, pharmaceutical, steel, pulp and paper, and other process industries. I support all of these industries in their digital transformation, especially um, as it has been alluded to before, is all looking at the new technology, new trends, artificial intelligence, and really advancing scientific innovation, manufacturing operations, customer experience, and much more. I have been in the industry for more than 20 years. I've worked uh, actually in the past for Solvay, which now, of course, has split into ScienceCo. So it is uh, such a pleasure today to be here with my colleagues at Science Co. I have also worked for Johnson & Johnson in multiple leadership roles, all the way from R&D innovation to manufacturing, supply chain, mergers and acquisition, sales and marketing. And then for the last three years, I have been here at Microsoft supporting various industries, including manufacturing and all sub vehicles from um, manufacturing, semiconductors, aerospace and chemicals. I have also supported pharmaceuticals and much more. And today I am so delighted to be here with this panel to share some of the best insights, hopefully uh, that you out uh, right there can learn from us. And then hopefully all together come to really unleash the, the next generation of innovation. Okay, so maybe I'll go next. I am Alana Spurugusik. I am a professor of chemistry and computer science as well as material science and chemical engineering at the University of Toronto and a faculty member at the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Sounds like a lot, yes, professors wear many hats. I also have co-founded companies in this space. I have co-founded Kebotics, a company that since 2017 does AI for materials discovery, and also have co-founded Zapata Computing, a company that does quantum computing, uh, including uh, topics related to molecules and materials. And recently, we're very excited because we launched a company called Intrepid Labs that uses AI for drug formulation. What I'm doing at the University of Toronto uh, now is I lead the largest grant ever given to a Canadian university, uh, $200 million Canadian, which is about $150 million USD, uh, to develop the concept of self-driving laboratories, AI-driven research labs, where AI picks what are the next experiments to make and the robots make and test the molecules and materials. We do that for solid state materials, all the way to polymers, molecules, small molecules for drug discovery and or molecules from materials. Uh, it's called a consortium and not an institute because we are very interested in working with industry and government. So we have already several foundational companies join, uh, joining us as members of the consortium, such as Merck Europe, uh, uh, such as Roche and Tech uh, and, and other companies. Uh, so if you're interested in joining our consortium, uh, please contact, uh, contact us. I will put the link on the chat. And looking forward to talking about what can AI do for Matthias' discovery? Uh, I, I happen to be the pioneer of developing generative models for molecules. Back in 2012, 2014, we developed the first autoencoders to develop molecular discovery. Uh, we also did the first paper for an AI discovered drug with in silico medicine, which is a company I work with. So we've been around for a while, and I'm happy to talk at, about this uh, topic from more the science side rather than the uh, business side, as well as the startup side rather than the big corporation side. And let me complete uh, that, uh, that round. Uh, so Nicola, uh, happy to be uh, with all of you today. I lead artificial intelligence for BCG, uh, the consulting firm, and I'm also part of the leadership team of BCGX. BCGX, so unbeknownst to many, BCG actually has a tech arm of 3,000 people, data scientists, AI engineers, software developers, 
product managers, designers who does technology, not consulting. Um, and so we build uh, custom AI solutions for our clients, but also, of course, we help them lend the value uh, from it and transform their organization, their operating model, their processes. So I, I joined this with that, uh, that perspective on how do we make this happen in large corporations and how do we get from the promise, I would say, of artificial intelligence, which is obviously extremely significant into, uh, you know, into real value for, uh, uh, for our companies and, and society at large. Thank you for the succinct um, introductions and, you know, giving a flavor of your background when you, we know that we're only touching the surface of it. Now, as part of this discussion, I really think it's important to understand the current challenges before we even go into the solution. So one of the things that I look into as part of my role as the chemistry materials expert here at Hello Tomorrow is looking into the trends and looking at, you know, the statistics and the enabling technologies that are out there. If we consider the manufacturing and the chemicals industry as a whole, we can look at the impact uh, that it's having on climate change through three main parameters. So there's things like carbon dioxide emissions, water management, also resource depletion. Now, if we zoom in on that last point, there are two striking figures that when I found out, I was like, Oof, I'm blown away. So the first one is per annum. So every single year, we we mine about 90 billion tons of natural resources every single year. That's a lot of natural resources that we mine. The second thing is if we consider the sustainable circular chain and access to critical resources. So these are your copper, your lithium, your nickel, manganese, graphite, etc. These are essential resources for things like deployment of our electrification needs, for things like developing our electric grids, for batteries, etc. If we were to continue our current consumer habits now, and also continue uh, how we are consuming electricity and other resources as a society, we would need in the next 30 years the same amount of critical resources as we have used for the last 2000 years. So if we ask ourselves, number one, technically, is this feasible? And secondly, is this sustainable? The overwhelming answer is absolutely not. So we need to change the way that we are processing, change the way that we are working and, uh, you know, as a society as a whole, but also look into alternative technologies and solutions. So there is hope. Now I go into some of the solutions and I really want to set up the discussion for this is last month we had this fantastic breakthrough and it was a collaboration between Microsoft Azure Quantum Elements and a um, laboratory called Pacific Northwestern National Laboratory in the US. So what the researchers do was they applied AI to high performance computing to develop a candidate that could re reduce the amount of lithium required in batteries by about 70%. Now, this alone is fantastic, but also what was incredible was the speed of this discovery. If we consider that actually the amount of research, normally traditional methods, would have taken decades worth of research and they've condensed it into several months. And also after finding the candidate, they were able to synthesize it. So I would like to expand a little bit and ask uh, the panelists if you could expand the role of AI in developing new molecules, new materials for future transformative tech to commercializing. And because, you know, we have our, our little news article from Microsoft, I would love to hear the perspective from Yuri first, and then we can see from the other panelists. Thank you, Rainbow. And uh, you bring such a wonderful perspective on how uh, technology really is changing the paradigm of sustainable discoveries. Um, if I start, then AI really is playing such a tremendous role in advancing scientific innovation. Historically, one of the main challenges in discovering molecules, as we know, and developing products is related to a few uh, factors, but one of the key factors there is time to market. So this constraint is obviously uh, impacted by the incredible time it takes to evaluate existing data from patents, internal documents, external literature, and even blending it with no hypothetical intuition as to what could be the next formulation or the next molecular reaction. Well, scientists have been for decades constrained by really access to data. 
and wars by limited access to intelligent insights that gives them the best possible parameters for ingredients, for physical and performance properties of those materials, or even data that ties their scientific experiments to real facts of the world, such as environmental regulations or climate change or toxicity. Um, and so all of these really um, is, is hindering this uh, scientific innovation. Customer preferences alone uh, for new innovation products and even pricing is very difficult to even factor in into the product design. So with the advent of AI, we now are compressing hundreds of years of experimentation to just a few months, as you mentioned, um, Rainbow, uh, in the case of the National Pacific uh, Northwest Laboratory, where we should case the light speed acceleration of molecular candidate evaluation for the development of electric batteries. We went roughly from over 40 million possible candidates to just uh, 30,000 uh, or less possible candidates. And that's really super impactful. Another uh, impactful customer story is then the work that we at Microsoft did at Johnson Mathey. One key area of Johnson Mathey's R&D sustainable technologies is finding better catalysts for hydrogen fuel cells the power truck and buses. But the most effective, um, but better catalyst for, hydri for hydrogen um, today is platinum. I think you mentioned that um, rainbow, right? It's platinum, lithium and others. But these are very rare uh, materials and very expensive. Uh, the company has expanded its groundbreaking digital research in ele electrocatalysts to develop alternate alloy catalysts that use less platinum to drive down the cost of fuel cell technology. And this research evidently requires significant computational resources that can simulate atomic complex interactions with materials. So given all of this complexity and the time for their explorations, they have turned to Microsoft to support them with our, our Azure Quantum Elements platform. And we have helped them explore new predictive modeling tools that could accelerate the nanoparticle simulations for discovering new catalysts. So Johnson Mathey has substantially increased the throughput of calculations that have been needed to understand these materials by more than 50%. Of course, all of this has been uh, done with the technology that is current today, with AI, with HPC, with quantum. So I think this is powerful. And companies are really seeing the immense promise that AI and HPC combine can bring to scientific innovation. So I think really, you know, to highlight, I think that today is the best time in our generation to be in the space of molecular discovery, to be a scientist, to be an investor, and to advance companies that are invested in innovation with applied AI and HPC and cloud. Thank you. That's fantastic. And I would love to hear um, also from Van Santo, because I know he has such a, a huge background in transformative tech and also with AI. So I would love to hear your thoughts about this too, Van Santo. Thank you, Rainbow. And then I will let uh, Alan and Nicola comment because I think they have great uh, elements as well to add to all the background uh, what you have shared. So, so yeah, and I think on our side, you know, the, our business at Sciencesco is to develop sustainable solutions to, uh, to help our cost customers and industries like mitigate the impact, reduce their waste or lower the emissions. So we really see it uh, as a transformative uh, capability uh, using AI on all the research work that we do. But I think what we wanted to put an emphasis is really about co-creating with our customers because we, we are successful as a company for in position, you know, to get access to the data, really understand what's the problem to be solved so that we can develop really the right material or the right formulation or bring the right supports for our customers uh, and to ensure that they deliver uh, what is at stake. So I will give you just one, one, one example. Uh, it's been a few years that we have been uh, investing and developing our AI models, particularly focusing on the biodegradability of molecules, because we know that this is a critical component that will be important if you want to ensure that you have really a sustainable solution. And that's something you do because you start really co compiling the data, looking at what exists outside, inside our company and so on to deliver the right model. And that's just one idea. And, uh, and we know again that on that field that we are not going to, to do it alone. And that's why as well that we are working with partners. We work with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We just announced 
as well a partnership with Climate Impulse, huh, which is which aim is to develop the first uh, hydrogen uh, airplane to fly around the world nonstop in nine days. I can tell you they have tremendous amount of of a challenge huh, to have liquefied hydrogen in a tank during nine days. It's not something a lot of people are have done and on that we will leverage a lot of AI and simulation capabilities because you need to make a lot of runs before you're in position to develop the right material that is needed. So that's just a flavor, but that's how we, we try to approach that to support our customers. And I think Alan, you wanted to react. Sure, I would like to say that, uh, well, uh, Microsoft uh, Assure Quantum Elements, welcome to the party. We, the academics and the startups have been doing this since 2017 at least. Uh, companies like our own, Kevotics or Citrine Informatics, do the kinds of things that uh, the new Microsoft tool can do. I just want to just make sure that everybody knows that that's just one tool that is out there. There's many other tools, many other different ways of doing this. I just want to highlight some of the case studies. Uh, uh, for example, in Kevotics, we developed a new organic light emitting diode material in about three months. We have developed new pigments for uh, for polymers that are right now under testing also in a few months. And we specialize also on doing something that is very exciting, which is generate candidate molecules with the computer and AI, test them, sometimes with self-driving labs, sometimes with regular synthesis, but also work with our back uh, channel partners uh, across the globe um, to actually provide you a kilo of sample, for example. So it's not only that we actually discover the material, but we make sure that your engineers and scientists have actually something to test which is a big, big gap, right? Because if you only compute things and there's no real material, right? Then how can you test it in your industry? So we found out that, that Kevorex is the most exciting way of actually uh, dealing with clients. So that's one of the, um, I think, uh, proof points that tools like this actually can help uh, several companies around the world uh, advance. Um, I, think, I think what um, is ahead of us is how can we make sure that all the chemical sciences across all sectors, for example, our new startup in Trepid Labs working on formulation, right? The problem of drug formulation, right? Which is a very interesting problem. Um, how can we make sure that all the industries across pharma, materials, sciences, uh, um, oil, et cetera, uh, have access to this technology as soon as possible because uh, Rainbow started this with the urgency uh, of transforming our supply chains, for example, for the critical minerals, as you said, but also, of course, uh, green chemistry kevotics is now very 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 focused on the problem of green chemistry and and circular economy um so it is a big global challenge we all need to collaborate across uh, all the different sectors in the world and and, and platforms like this uh, allows us to actually bring the message forward to everybody in the chemical industry and materials industry that we should all work together on solving these problems humanity has no time Thank you for your insights. Honestly, it's incredible. And one of the other things that I would really like to touch upon is honestly hearing your insights into why now. So if we're looking purely into investments, because we know that money speaks, if we're looking at the amount of investments that are going into AI startups, we look at the last three years between 2021 to 2023, over 150 billion USD was pumped into investments for AI startups. Now, clearly something is happening and everyone is talking about AI. So I would love to hear your insights about what is specifically happening now, what are the key enablers, and what are the really success factors that is enabling AI uh, to really take the center stage? So if I could hear, for example, Thomas, I know you are you know, uh, director of the digital transformation, so it would be fantastic to hear this. I guess you are referring to me, Rainbow. Uh, so, yes, I mean, indeed, we are we are seeing a a significant shift in, let's say, the way AI is perceived by the investment, but also the the corporate world. And if you so you talk about investment, what is interesting is between 2022 and 2023, investment in startups in general has plummeted. I mean, minus 30 percent, depending on how you look at things. But the mix has radically changed. And you went from a mix which was where AI was a small minority, 15 to 20% of the investments, to a mix where it's, depending on how you count, I mean, north of 50% for sure and, and up to 70% of all the money that is 
being uh, directed uh, towards uh, towards uh, startups. So yes, that has been accelerated even against the backdrop of investment drought uh, in uh, in the ecosystem. What happened, of course, is the advent uh, of generative AI in the public world. I would say because you know the technology is not that new, uh, but the understanding of it is extremely new, especially among uh, you know CEOs. But then, uh, to a broader extent, let's say the, the the investment world. Just a fun fact: I had more CEO conversations on AI over the last 12 months than I had over the last 12 years. I've been working on AI in various forms since 2011, uh, you know, and what was a technical topic that interested 5% of an organization is now a CEO level topic that everyone has to report to their board about and that everyone has to talk to the market about. And, and therefore it is creating this level of excitement. Underneath it, of course, you have some much more fundamental trends, which is the evolution of, let's say, uh, the way people are, you know, uh, uh, thinking about AI, the underlying, uh, you know, te you know, uh, technology of transformers, the availability of computing power. Uh, but I would say the big shift is really the the sense of accessibility and therefore the understanding of the potential of AI from, uh, you know, uh, uh, from uh, from higher ups in um, in organizations. Thank you. And um, I would love to hear other perspectives as well. So would the other panelists have, you know, what are your key insights on the topic? Like why now? Why this interest? Alan, you want to go first and maybe I'll chime in? Yeah, I mean, we are in a convergence uh, time, right? I mean, uh, for example, um, we use robotic technology to synthesize materials and molecules at the Acceleration Consortium, right? And just in the time that we started using robotic arms to do chemistry, the price of them has gone down like the same way the price of solar cells has gone down. And um, now, you know, if you buy uh, a Chinese robotic arm, it can be as low as $5,000, $8,000 Canadian dollars, right? Which is incredible, right? You used to buy these universal robotic arms for $50,000. That means that we can have literally chemical production lines, right? Um, we have... Um, uh, huge advances in AI for molecular discovery. When we did the first convolutional neural networks paper, which is now my most cited paper, actually, 3,000 citations or more, I forget. Um, it was the first time uh, uh, there was a convolutional network designing a molecule. The reason there's 3,000 citations to that is because now the technology of how to do molecular design has advanced. We have, like, of course, uh, you know, um, um, neural networks are much, much smarter about molecular symmetries, use way less data, they have better representations, right? And finally, um, by the convergence of, uh, of the, the ability of these robots to make the molecules, we actually have clean data sets. One of the biggest problems in the materials and molecular industry is that the data sets suck. Even if you use these AIs to mine the literature and you go there and get all the data using your large language models or whatever you want, the problem is that the data out there is not clean and reproducible. Whatever is done in one lab is not necessarily reportable in the other lab. Conditions are slightly different. People had mistakes, etc. So we have found over and over that it's much better to generate your data in situ with a robot quickly and act on it, right? So I think the convergence of all these technologies allows us to do these things now. Like if you ask me combinatorial chemistry of the 1980s or 1990s, which I think is going to come up later in the discussion, um, uh, why did it fail in, in some sense? It's because people were shooting molecules in in, in, in uh, shooting molecular candidates kind of randomly. Now we have a much more way of uh, a much much better way of actually honing in on the right material, right? So I think that is where the, the change has happened, uh, and also because AI, as as Nicola was saying, AI is in everybody's in everybody's uh, attention right now. Um, the industry will actually jump into it, right? Everybody wants to do something with an LLM, right? It's amazing, right? There's way more technology beyond the LLMs that we need to use to do this, like Bayesian optimization, which is crucial, right? And all these technologies now uh, are going to be really, really gathering attention from the chemical industry because everybody is thinking about AI nowadays. So thanks to ChatGPT and those models because they popularized all of the other models that will allow us to actually transform the chemical industry. 
Yes, that's such a wonderful perspective, Alan. Uh, and I think, you know, I so much agree with you. I think that while the field of artificial intelligence is not new, the profound advances in the last couple of years have been dramatic. AI requires a lot of data, as we know, computational power, and also connectivity between human and data, and even human and machine. So I think, uh, Rainbow, to your question, uh, data has always existed, but only a few organizations have really developed a solid data strategy to mine the value of that data. I think Alan referred to the need for having clean data. That is so important, right? And I think that has been one of the biggest challenges. But now we know that data also is more valuable when it's shared across uh, plants and geographies and even across suppliers and customers, or pretty much when it is democratized widely across the enterprise. So in the past, the main data state was on-premise. Uh, you know, a lot of companies have been having their own data centers. They don't want to share. They are afraid of cloud. And then uh, this data sharing and access has been very limited. But today, what has changed is that cloud technologies have challenged that mindset, and companies now are accelerating the migration of data to cloud. Then we, when we add all of these extraordinary advances in technology, including AI, generative AI, and high-performance computing, and then we can see the amazing phenomena of a race to, uh, to AI-based innovation, we know that you know the value of why now it's there, right? And so that's when you have to start to see most companies jumping, probably not more on investments or new innovation, but it's AI, AI-driven innovation. Companies really see the clear value that technology brings to their manufacturing, to their supply chain, to their R&D, and to their customer experience operations. And that's how AI uh, really is clearly the engine of future growth and profitability. So if we expand a little bit on your point just now, Yuri, so if we compare, so with most technologies, you know, we see these like um, almost like a, a sine wave, you see ups and downs, ups and downs. If we focus specifically on the technology side of things, in the 2010s, there was this mini boom for high throughput um, experimentation. So there was a lot of data that was acquired. What kind of lessons can we learn from that boom specifically? Um, and what could be different now? Now we have AI guided discovery. Now we have these AI tools. Yeah, I think a few points here, uh, Rainbow. Um, so in the chemical industry, high throughput experimentation has become essential for faster data generation and accelerating product development uh, cycles evidently. But the key enabled, enablers uh, in the past that have facilitated all of this event of high throughput experimentation have been about automation and robotics, for example. How these automated systems have allowed uh, parallel execution of experiments, significantly improving the throughput and efficiency. Also another uh, good enabler has been miniaturization, right? Especially when we look at liquid handling systems uh, to enable thousands of experiments per day with really limited resources. And then we look at analytical techniques and these analytical methods have been capable of generating critical data in line to increase rate of experimentation and speed. Um, but then we also look at computational methods and then data repositories. And these tools have been crucial for designing experiments for optimizing conditions. But uh, I think so pretty much the combination of automation, miniaturization and advanced analytics uh, plus computational tools has revolutionized, revolutionized the way the high throughput experimentation has added value to scientific discovery and chemical industries. Um, but what's different today, Rainbow and, and team here, is that uh, many things have changed. So technology has changed drastically, as we know, and we were talking about this before, uh, especially capabilities in cloud, uh, in AI, in high performance computing. And these technologies, in my opinion, are really uh, revolutioni revolutionizing how all companies do research and how quickly companies can innovate. Um, going back to 2010, uh, well, the scientific community witnessed a lot of searching high throughput scientific discovery. But machine learning algorithms were just developed to discern patterns in complex scientific data sets. Fast forwarding to today, 
we find ourselves into a new area that, that is marked by really the widespread use of generative AI tools. If we just look at these tools and how you know this all has been evolving, we look at the key differences. And one of them, for example, is the nature of innovation. Today, generative AI tools is generating, uh, helping scientists and companies to generate new content, to go beyond just a simple analysis and create novel outputs. In terms of functionality, generative AI also produces realistic synthetic content. It can include text, it can look at your molecular structures, it can all combine all of these and guide scientists with better experiments, right? They can help uh, scientists to really create the novel experimentations that is based on synthetic critical information evidently, but also can elucidate potential reactive pathways. So I think this is this is important, right? The creative power of generative AI uh, tools is changing the paradigm. And lastly, I think what I want to mention is applications. Today with generative AI and other AI-based models, we can impact many areas, including natural language processing, drug discovery and scientific writing. So when we think about the life of a scientist, the life of an engineer in do doing all of their experiments, we know they are always constrained by really how much research they can do, how much uh, experiments in the lab they can do. But now pretty much we are really converging the opportunity to use natural language and all these large language models to really accelerate that output, that innovation and that discovery. And to me, uh, Rainbow, that really is, uh, is what's changing. Fantastic. That is absolutely succinct. And I think this is really valuable information for our audience and also just understanding what's happening within the industry as a whole. Um, I would also love to hear in terms of what's we're seeing in academia. So what exactly can we can we see? I know, you know, high throughput um, experimentation has been around for many, many, many years. But what exactly can we learn? And, you know, we know that within academia and also within industry that they are miles and miles ahead um, and really are at the forefront of developing the new technology. So, Alan, would you love to comment on that? Oh, you're on mute, FYI. Absolutely. I just posted a review of Seth Driving Labs on the chat that will be, you know, tells you what has been done in academia up, up until last year. But let me give you a few highlights from different groups around the world, right? Uh, my colleague and friend, Andy Cooper, uh, about two or three years ago, I forget, he published a paper where uh, a mobile robot was actually moving around in a lab, uh, doing Catalyst 24-7. In a weekend, he did more research than an entire PhD, right? To the point that this has been done in academia many times now in different contexts, right? Um, different technologies have shown, uh, for example, we recently showed, and I also shared the paper, that seven labs around the world all together, we use self-driving labs in different labs and developed a delocalized global self-driving lab. So we were shipping actually molecules between different labs, use software uh, to actually organize where the powders were and synthesize different blocks in different places, test them in another place, scaled in another one, and then um, finally made devices in Japan. So that's another example how, uh, and what we did there was actually display molecules, organic lasers. Uh, we have the best organic lasers in the world. That's an example from our group. But uh, there's all sorts of other uh, different interesting academic uh, examples. Uh, uh, people formulating much better fin films for solar cells and, and so on. Finally, um, I will tell you where I think the field is going. Um, we, were, we, we have an era of position-based liquid handling robots that actually are, you know, basically represented by companies like FreeSlate and, and, and um, uh, ChemSpeed, you know, um, et cetera, right? Um, now, uh, Unchained Labs, sorry, Unchained Labs and ChemSpeed and other companies like that. These are pretty monolithic systems, very expensive. Um, so what many of us have been thinking about is the future of the self-driving laboratory is actually in the future. Of course, think about it five, 10 years from now. It's really a humanoid robot entering the room, seeing what's going on, picking up the glass where I'm working on it. And we are very advanced towards that te technology. So we just developed a tool called Organa, uh, touching to what Judy was talking about. You can talk to it thanks to the power of LLMs. But what Organa does is actually plans an experiment and carries out the experiment on the fly. So we have shown how Organa, for example, which uses robot arms and also liquid handlers in a combination, 
can actually carry out electrochemical experiments, including cleaning, cleaning up the electrodes, by doing the entire planning using AI, right? With a natural language interface. So I think in the future, five, 10 years from now, you will see these uh, robots using regular chemical glassware, using computer vision, which has been demonstrated by many, including us, as well as, um, uh, as, well as voice control and, and, and planning algorithms to be able to actually carry out complex campaigns and make decisions as the campaign happens that won't replace humans, but actually allow us to actually be much more productive. Go ahead, Nicola. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I, I know you wanted me to, to comment. So I'm going to come from a very, very different place because, you know, first, I'm, I'm nowhere near the level of, you know, understanding of, uh, you know, AI for materials, anyone on this on this panel. I come from a place of, okay, how do you translate that into actual change in, uh, you know, corporate organizations and making this used. And what I've seen, this is not new, actually, it has been accelerated over the last 12 months. Maturity in business organizations trails technological maturity by quite a lot. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure that you know, we are able to do things today that are, you know, miles ahead of what you know, your average uh, corporation is uh, is able to, to let's say, understand, but also adopt. And the big factor ultimately is the, is the human factor. We have this uh, formula, it's not a chemical formula, uh, but there's the 10, 20, 70 formula. You know, 100% of the effort in AI is 10% about AI, 20% about data, uh, and 70% about people. And you know, ultimately, if you want to have, and I love the idea of self-driving self labs. I, you know, I, I hear it for the first time. I found it extraordinary. But if you, you know, if you're driving AI, you know, to its max potential today, the level of disruption that it causes on teams, processes, organizations, operating models is extreme. And either you're able to automate 100% and no longer have to deal with humans, which in some processes is feasible, or you still have to, but then the level of change that you have to do to, let's say, the humans that remain, uh, you know, is extremely, extremely high. People have to, you know, unlearn how they used to work and learn very new ways of working. And if we look at the past of digital transformation, and again, been doing this for a little bit too long than I would admit, um, uh, is it's this is the hardest part. This is the hardest part, um, you know, it's how do you drive process change? How do you redesign ways of working? How do you make people, you know, able to work with machines when it makes sense, but also let machines do what they know how to do better than us, you know, and avoid overrides that are not, uh, that are not necessary. And, and that, is the, that is the hardest balance. And this is mostly a, a management role. It is not a technological role. It's not a scientific role. It is really the the job of uh, of leaders and managers. But it's uh, usually where all of this, let's say, crashes against against reality. And why a lot of this technology is actually quite mature today, but vastly underutilized. And I'm not even talking about you know generative AI and LLMs. I'm just talking about things that have been cracked even since the 70s, you know, are still underutilized in, uh, you know, large corporations today. So, you know, let's not even talk about the latest things, huh? No, and, and I, I love, I can, I can add a final comment to it. And I love what you just said, Nicola. I think it resonates quite a lot to how we're taking it on. And I, I will really build on what Alan, Yuri, and, and you have been saying. Uh, because Alan, you talked earlier about bias and optimization. That's something we do since a few a few years we practice in our R&D department that we've as well made a lot of effort in robotics and automation. And, and you read to your point, we're as well uh, looking at approaches, looking at uh, using computing power. We want to accelerate and so on. But I think to the initial question you asked, Rainbow, the, the way we see it on our end is that we are the moment where we can connect the dots. It's fantastic. It's an amazing opportunity. We can connect all those dots together. And I was reading uh, as well uh, quickly the, the question that were, were coming from the audience. And I saw a question about CapEx and, and uh, investment. And personally, from where I stand, it's not an issue of, of CapEx and investment. For sure, it will be because it's always a game in, in the company to, to be in position to, to maximize the value that we want to, to generate. But the issue to me is 
is to focus on what is the critical point. And I will, uh, and I think that's where as well, Nicolas, you were pointing at, at it. I, I, um, I did a bit of my time, a little research on emotional intelligence. And I think having the right skill set when it comes to looking from a critical eye, what's happening, you talked about the entrance in the labs of, of a natural language. It's super important now that we really pay attention to the human side of it. And whatever we do, we look at adoption, we look at having the right wide res and so on. So I think it's a fascinating moment from that standpoint. And it will succeed if we take this broad picture to it, because that will, Academia showed us an amazing, amazing path. I think the examples Alan you are sharing are, are just mind blowing. And I, I think uh, I can speak on the name of all the community of researchers at that sense code. They all want to have the same and to do the same. And they're all eager to, to, to go on that path, but to be in capacity to connect the, to data and integrate that into our processes to support our customers. That's the art. That's where the fun starts. And this is where we really were, we're looking at it. And we had a bit of discussion with Nicola and the team on it. And we know that's where we will need to spend a lot of time and focus as we go, because that's where we will ensure that everybody owns that amazing transformation. And it's not a top down or bottom up or hype. It's really something that becomes part of the day to day job of, of everyone. I see time is going by very quickly. So I would like to pose a very quick question to Vincent and Yuri specifically, because we know that in the audience and also and we're touching a little bit about what Alan was saying about the startups, the new technologies, the innovation. What can companies like ScienceCo and Microsoft do now and in the future to ensure that you know collaborative um, initiatives with startups to develop, to nurture, and to ensure that we scale these new technologies. Yeah, and I can go first and please you re, uh, add, uh, add on it. But I would say we see definitely a lot of, you know, different value that when it comes to uh, the processes in our plant, when it comes to uh, what we just discussed about uh, the way you can run the labs and our innovations. Uh, we did not, I mean, we had a bit uh, point about sustainability, but you know, uh, looking at our impact and the whole challenge about ensuring that we can mitigate, reduce it as well as a big company is part of where this whole AI and Gen AI acceleration is an amazing as well opportunity. So, but I think my on my side, my my conviction is very simple: is that we will not not do that alone, not at all. I mean, if I just listen, Alan, there is so many things happening. <laughs> and I was taking a few notes of what I was not uh, you know aware of, and I think it's. There's only opportunity. So to me, it's we need to partner. We need to work with startups and so on. So that's where the, your platform like Hello Tomorrow is is an amazing opportunity because we know that we need to unite energies. Uh, we're here to advance humanity, and we'll do that if we work with the best on that field. So so yeah, to me, it's really that that opportunity, and love the discussion today because that's exactly building on that spirit. That, that's so wonderful, there, Vincent. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, you know, totally. I think that the future of research is all about collaboration and partnership. Um, chemical companies can continue to bring their expertise in scientific discovery, in deep expertise of the chemical field. Uh, but we have to really bring tech partners, technology companies such as Microsoft and others in the partner ecosystem, uh, which are very crucial really to then uh, seed in, in you know, the innovation and accelerate the pathway to innovation. Uh, at Microsoft, for example, we have, uh, as you heard from me, uh, and probably you have, uh, you know, if you follow that company, we have many technologies and capabilities uh, that we are deploying at scale across many industries of all types, not only for the chemical industry, but also oil and gas and, and pharma and even finance and other companies. Uh, we have uh, the capabilities and also we have made big investments and big bets in technology uh, and technologies that will be here for the next decade. And I think Vincent, to your point, to really transform humanity, what we can really do uh, to, you know, to unleash really the power of this generation to solve the most critical issues out there. Um, the future of science and innovation uh, growth is going to really be, be going to be fueled by AI as we know by cloud, by HPC, uh, we bring the human element, Nicolas, to your point. I don't think we are ever going to replace humans. Humans is really the core component of all intelligence. But what we are going to see is really now 
humans need to uh, advance, right? Humans are going to be better at thinking about the future, not today and yesterday. Today and yesterday can be better handled by robots and, and by automation, but humans will need to really redefine what the future holds. Um, Evidently, research will be based on ethical and responsible policies. Our technologies will unleash the true potential of product discovery and innovation in critical areas for our society. Uh, and all the way from sustainable advanced materials that are eco-friendly, that are healthy, that are cost-effective to produce, and that's very important. Um, and so to ensure scalability, companies really need to start with the goal in mind. Uh, and that's why we recommend with uh, to a lot of the customers and companies we work uh, with uh, to start with the business outcomes that they want to drive. Uh, to ensure also that they have the executive commitment uh, to invest in technology. Um, and I think, you know, getting started is just one step of the process. But what companies and partners and everybody out there needs to really think is about the long term commitment to deploy use cases at scale. Many companies are still stuck in just de developing and deploying one use case and one MVP, and then they really don't see how to advance. And that's the problem. If we really want to advance uh, and maximize the, the capabilities of technology today, we got to really think with the scalability in mind. That's fantastic. Thank you. And what I'm really distilling and hearing from you guys is really it takes an ecosystem, an ecosystem of um, corporates, of academics, of investors and startups to really make and transform and see positive change in our societies, which is completely what we stand for as a society, or as a company. Um, now we are going to open to our Q and A section. So I'm going to the questions tab, and I can see someone from Alice. Uh, I'm looking at the upvoted ones. How do you envisage AI shaping the future of manufacturing over the next decade? What are the emerging areas of innovation do you anticipate AI will drive within the manufacturing sector? And where do you see the most promising opportunities for advancement? Who would like to take that? Alan, do you want to go first? Super quickly. An example, collaboration between University of British Columbia, University of Toronto and Merck, uh, Merck USA. Um, there was a process chemistry problem, scaling up a particular transformation for the chemical industry. And in antimerics synthesis, we use a robotic platform informed by AI, Bayesian optimization, a few cycles, and we found the right reaction conditions to scale up this particular antimeric reaction. That's an example where inserting the AI in the process chemistry group of a pharma company can make a difference. Um, perhaps I will uh, add a few comments here. So I think the future uh, of AI and the future of innovation to me is really that intersection of humans, of data and machines that are going to be coming together um, like we have never seen before. Uh, for example, if we look at manufacturing, we have operators, right, that are always processing the big machines and, and assets and, you know, preparing for their, for their planning. They will be using copilots to interact with their manufacturing systems uh, with natural language processing. And they will be able to solve the most pressing business questions, such as quality. Like, what's the quality of my product? What's happening with my product? Uh, what cost improvements? How can I improve my process in terms of cost? How can I actually deliver better customer satisfaction? How can I improve safety in my operations and operating procedures? And maybe uh, what is that root cause of some issue that is happening in real manufacturing settings? Uh, if we look into R&D, then scientists and engineers can be uh, working together to develop smart uh, plants and products, uh, converging that time for product development and product transfer. And this is right, uh, not even so futuristic as we are already seeing it. Uh, Rainbow, you brought the case of Pacific uh, National Laboratory. Um, we are going to be really uh, working through creating breakthroughs anywhere they are, uh, especially so we look at scientists and, and engineers today. One of the constraints is that they have to be in the lab and in a manufacturing setting uh, tomorrow. And that is actually happening also starting to happen slowly, but it's going to really maximize is uh, the opportunity to have a flexibility to in innovate anywhere you are. Imagine your mobile phone, you are 
taking it, taking your calls and go working on the phone, innovation will be uh, done in the same setting. And this is possible because of flexible technology, secure technology capabilities and elasticity. Scientists incorporating real time customer feedback is going to be possible because now with technology and, and the ability to really connect uh, very quickly, the customer insights into your innovation and even map into literature to develop the best product lines of tomorrow. Um, and executives with that right operational and financial insights are going to be delighted really to make better decisions and knowing that right strategic decisions in areas of focus, of focus that will allow them then to fuel that growth and delight their customers. And again, all of this is AI, Cloud, HPC, Quantum Edge, and much more. Thank you, Yuri. Um, did any of our other panelists have any um, thing to add or shall we go on with the next question? Absolutely fine. Okay, for the next question, the next one is saying from Sabrina saying, how to drive change at human level, upskilling everyone will take time. Any takers for this one? I'm, I'm happy to take it from the professor perspective. Um, the most important thing I think is the, the young generations, right? We're all a bunch of middle-aged people here in the panel talking about this, but uh, what really matters, oh, Nicolas says he's very young, but Nicolas is 25. But, <laughs> you know, what I really believe uh, when we should be in, in, involving is the young generations, right? Like the high school kids, the undergraduates. It's absolutely incredible what the high school children have been, do have been doing in my lab. We have this kid called Sebastian Arellano that published three papers this summer, right? Using LLMs for chemistry. So... Uh, those are the generations that I think are crucial for uh, making humanity adopt this. They care a lot about the environment. They care all about human rights, all about gender issues, way more than the people about my age. And those are the people that I really believe are going to be the hello for tomorrow, if you want to use the pun, okay? Mm -hmm. The young people. So anything that we can do in the corporates, for example, Ciencesco or Microsoft, uh, or even the consulting companies like BCG, to involve the young people, inspire them, to leave their cell phone, to leave their YouTube and enter the world of science and engineering technology uh, will change the planet, right? Uh, so we need to make a sustainable world and they are the ones that are going to use the world. So as the indigenous people in Canada say, think seven generations before and seven generations ahead of you. Mm -hmm. So I'm really talking about the seven generations ahead. Uh, I think uh, the young people are what's going to make the world move around. So I think that's, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I would, I would say, I mean, first, it is it is a daily challenge that we see upskilling everyone will be difficult and indeed there will be a wave of let's say young generation coming uh that will by default a little bit be much more used to using these uh these technologies than others but i would so also say that i mean people have to feel i would not say the pressure but the need to upskill themselves if it's top down like we are going to force the fact that everyone will you know it, for sure it will not work but if you have in organizations at least core groups of super users that then become let's say the lighthouse people can look at and get inspiration from and then generates let's say the the inspiration for others it has to be a self-motivated upskilling if you if you you know sense what i what i what i mean you know if i look at our firm we have a core group of maybe 15 percent of the company that are heavy users of all of our internal generative ai tools for example and we use them to create much more adoption uh and upskilling among the rest of the population and yes 20 to 30 percent will not get there we already know it and even in our uh, you know company th that's just the fact and it's the fact of any single you know generational transformation like the one we're living right now you know the question is and there will be 20 30 percent of early adopters you don't have to do anything about them the middle i would rather use the early adopters as a you know uh, a forcing uh, you know mechanism for the others to to move rather than push it top down and and i would just add rendo 30 seconds i know time is is on <laughs> but uh, what alan said uh, i love it and nicola you touched on it it's it's uh, to me it's uh, about the message of hope uh we need to bring so much hope and ai is an amazing opportunity for us uh to you know to to do way better than what we've been doing and you, you started that 
webinar rainbow talking about you know the challenges of planet climate crisis that we're all facing and so on if you look at it as an outcome as a challenge we have so much more capabilities and capacities within our hands to do it so nicola you're talking about the, the self-motivation i think everybody has its own self motivation we're all on the same planet and so on and we're not we need to face that so to me that there is a magic power the, you know the energy the momentum is there and we have the chance to do it way faster and way better than we used to do being connected all of us together so so yeah i think that message alan fully aligned there is hope and we we can do it and we can take it as really an amazing booster cap capability absolutely and as one of the i guess closing remarks as we 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 should we need to finish up soon is absolutely the message of hope and collaboration is is honestly so number one it's been fantastic to have all the panelists to have you guys in the same room to discuss you know your insights into this industry but also really looking for the solutions and looking towards the future so number one thank you for your insights it's been fantastic having you guys here um a very quick uh, shout out to say that not all the questions that um, due to timings, we won't, can't answer all of these questions, but we can uh, send you a reply afterwards and follow up in the email, so do not worry about that. Um, secondly, I would also love to thank the audience again, all the participants. If you do want to continue this discussion in person, um, the Hello Tomorrow uh, Global Summit is round the corner. Science Co. will also be present there at the Global Summit. It is the 21st and the 22nd of March. Alternatively, feel free to keep in touch via our newsletters, other events, and LinkedIn. Thank you all again for your time. Thank you all, Gil, again for your insights. I hope you have the best rest of your day as possible, and we will keep in touch. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.